Hi, I'm Dr. Krupka. You are about to watch the gastrointestinal physiology video. Man, that sounds boring. Don't worry, it's not as bad as you think. It'll be quick and painless. We're going to teach you about the physiology of the gastrointestinal tract, and then we'll get on to dysfunction and some tips for that. But this is the basis so you have a good understanding of what your gastrointestinal system is made of and what it's really designed to do. First, the purpose of digestion. We eat food to sustain life for pleasure. We eat it for social interaction. We digest our food as a way to process it and remove the beneficial parts for assimilation into our body. The entire process, in my view, can be broken down into three main phases. There's the breakdown of the food, the absorption of the nutrients, and the elimination of the waste. Okay, pretty simple. We're going to talk about what does what as far as your gastrointestinal tract is concerned. First, the upper gastrointestinal tract. Uh, the upper GI tract is responsible for breakdown and absorption. It can uh, consists of the mouth, the esophagus, the lower esophageal sphincter, the stomach, the pancreas, and the gallbladder. Yes, we're going to go over the, each of these in a little more detail. First of all, in the mouth. Your teeth, tongue, and saliva will all work together, we hope, to begin the breakdown of your food. Now, once you're done in the mouth, and believe it or not, let me dispel a common myth, we are designed to actually chew our food. So for those of you out there, and you know who you are, who tend to put something in your mouth, chew it once or twice, and swallow, not really the way it's supposed to work. Okay, We are supposed to chew our food more than once or twice. right? it should be somewhat mush by the time it exits our mouth, not just in two or three smaller pieces. So just be aware. Now, then once we're done with that, we swallow. That moves it into the esophagus. The esophagus is kind of a muscularly lined tube. Um, and through a, a motion we call peristalsis, it has this kind of coordinated contraction that moves our food like a conveyor belt down to our stomach. Now at the bottom of the esophagus, the top of the stomach, you have the lower esophageal sphincter. This is the door between the esophagus and the stomach, and where in many cases there is some dysfunction that allows for reflux activity, those of you that are familiar with acid reflux. Um, so that's why I wanted to mention it. It's not as important, I don't think, as most of the other organs and glands we're going to discuss, but, but it is a, a, a geographically a place where some dysfunction occurs that many people need to be aware of. So that's the lower esophageal sphincter. Now, in the stomach, the stomach is where you mechanically start to mix acid and enzymes with your food to create something called chyme. Now, it's a nice little trivial pursuit question if you ever get it. Uh, but chyme is that kind of applesauce consistency acidic mush that comes out of our stomach when we're done digesting our food there. Um, we also produce something called intrinsic factor in our stomach, which is there to protect B12 so that we can absorb it later on. Otherwise, B12 breaks down and it's, it's unusable after that. The pancreas produces enzymes that aid in breaking down our food. Now, the stomach mainly produces acid. The pancreas produces enzymes like amylase, protease, and lipase, both equally important in digesting our food. Next, we have the gallbladder. Believe it or not, the gallbladder does do things, right? It has a purpose. It stores bile from the liver to be secreted into the small intestines as the chyme passes by. This allows for emulsification of the fats that were in your meal. Now, two things the gallbladder does. It stores bile, that's pretty simple, um, and bile consists of trash from the liver and bile salts which are made to emulsify the fats in your diet so that you can absorb them appropriately. Those two things are combined in the gallbladder. The gallbladder stores that until it senses that the food passing by has a significant fat content. Then it, it contracts and squirts that bile onto the food. And then as it gets mixed into the food, it emulsifies the fat, and you're able to absorb that. That's the purpose of your gallbladder. If you do not have a gallbladder, if someone stole it from you, call the police. Right? I'm kidding. 
Um, if you don't have a gallbladder, you will not be able to store bile and then release it on demand. You will have a constant steady drip of bile whether you've eaten or not, no matter how much fat is in your meal. So when you eat a high fat meal, you're not going to have enough bile. When you don't eat anything, you're going to have bile dripping into your intestines for no reason. Okay, so that's what your gallbladder is for. It does do some work for you. Lower gastrointestinal tract, the lower GI tract, is mostly responsible for absorption and elimination. This consists of the small intestines, the ileocecal valve and the appendix, the colon, also known as the large intestines, the rectum and the anus. Now, small intestines, with the addition of bicarbonate and bile, we know where bile comes from, right? We just talked about that. The chyme changes from being acidic to basic or alkaline. You have roughly 10 to 20 feet uh, of small intestines, and most of the digestion and absorption takes place right here. This is where the brunt of it happens. Now, after that, your food moves on. This is in the lower right quadrant. Um, if you were to go between the, the belt loop on your hip and the belt loop just off center in your jeans on the right hand side, that's about where we're talking about. Uh, and you have the ileocecal valve in the appendix here. This is a junction between the small and large intestines. The ileocecal valve controls the flow from the small intestines into the large intestines. And there's a little cavern there where you have the ileocecal valve, and off to the side of it sits the appendix. So lower right-hand side, ileocecal valve and appendix, inside a little cave, so to speak, or compartment um, that bridges the small and large intestines. And then we get into the large intestines, again, also known as the colon. That mostly absorbs water from the stool. It contains your resident bacterial population, your normal bowel flora. Uh, and those maintain the environment in the intestines. They finish the digestive process, uh, uh, especially of your carbohydrates. And in that process, they create something called short chain fatty acids. Now, those of you that have had a GIFX test done with us, the stool sample that we do, again, there's another video on that. You're familiar with short chain fatty acids. It's one of the things we look for in that GIFX test that we do from Metametrics. So the normal bacteria eat your food, whatever's left of it. They poop out these short chain fatty acids. Those become food for the cells that line the intestinal tract, your cells, your border, your fence, so to speak. Those are fed by short chain fatty acids. And then the obviously the digestive tract or the digestive process ends with elimination, which is done through the rectum and the anus. It stores our stool until we have enough that it sends the signal that you need to have a bowel movement. You ignore it multiple times. It builds up. You get constipated. Oh, wait. No, never mind. So it sends the message that you're supposed to have a bowel movement. You go. You have your bowel movement. Everything comes out, and we're all happy. OK? So that's the job of the rectum and the anus. Now. There is some associated physiology. You have something called gut-associated lymphoid tissue, or GALT for short. Uh, this is not necessarily part of the digestive tract, but I think it's worth mentioning uh, because it makes up about 75% of your immune system. So nearly 75% of your immune system surrounds the intestinal tract. This is to protect you in, in the event that you have a dysfunctional gut barrier. You have an absorptive surface. If you're an adult, okay, an average size adult, you have the absorptive surface area equal to the size of a regulation tennis court in your intestinal tract. Right? If we pulled it all out, flattened it out, and laid it out on the ground, it would be a, roughly the size of a regulated, regulation singles tennis court. If that barrier becomes hyperpermeable, if too much stuff is let in, that exposes you to significant toxic and infective influx. And that is why the majority of your immune system surrounds your intestinal tract as this gut-associated lymphoid tissue. Remember that when we talk later about food allergies and autoimmune problems. This is significant. I wanted to make sure you were aware of that. That finishes our intestinal physiology or gastrointestinal physiology lecture. Not as bad as you thought, right? Now you're ready to go on and learn about the GI system and how it has dysfunction, and then some of the things you can do to keep it under control. So there's our contact information. Do feel free to leave a comment below the video, and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks for watching.